I'm not just cuddling bears just like to get the thrill of it, right? Like we're trying to figure out what they need so that we can provide more of what they need so that like humans and wild animals can both like thrive. The Mercedes-Benz Interview Lounge. Well, we are celebrating women all day and all month, of course. And now I get to do something I have selfishly been plotting on <laughs> for a long time. You know I love animals, and you guys are convinced that that's how I'm going to die one day. Yeah, because you're going to approach an animal and it's going to eat you. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. <laughs> but because of that, I have been following a woman on Instagram. Her name is Dr. Ray Wynn Grant. She is an ecologist, and when I tell you what she does, or better yet, when she tells you what she does, I think your minds are going to be blown. Hello, Dr. Ray. Wynn Grant, how are you? Hey, I'm extra good. I'm so happy to be with y'all today. Thank you so much for joining us. You have no idea how excited I am. She so. has been so excited about this. I'm really hoping you're going to oh tell her not to hug a bear, though, before the end of this interview. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, please. Listen, that is my... That is my PSA to <laughs> everyone listening. <laughs> Leave them alone. But how how do you know that? Let's talk about what you do. Okay, so I am a wildlife ecologist, and that means that I'm a scientist, right? And I study wild animals, and my goals are to prevent endangered species from going extinct, right? Like all of the polar bears and the whales and the sharks and the tigers out there that we love so much. I work with teams to develop the science to keep them around. Wow. So, you know, I'm one of those like environmental heroes. I love what I do. I've always loved what I've done. Um, I always wanted to do this since I was a kid. But in particular, if you follow me on social media, I am best known for stealing little baby black bears like little wild bear cubs and stuffing them in my jacket and taking selfies with them yes and so Hello. let's see yes. now this is where the problem <laughs> lies because this is what this one wants to do yes i do you are living my dream life <laughs> it is a dream it is a dream literally like people like like one of my biggest things is that like most people think oh to be a scientist that means you have like a lab coat on and you're like pipetting chemicals right like at a bench like no you can be out there in the wilderness like me and the reason that i have all these adorable pictures of me snuggling baby bears in the wild is because i study mama bears so i study like grown-up adult female badass women bears and they give birth during hibernation it's very very convenient because every winter, if they have a GPS collar on them, we give them a little GPS device, like what's exactly in your cell phone is what we give to these bears so we can track their movements. I know exactly where they're hibernating. First step is I tranquilize them, okay? All right, like is everyone listening? Like do not ever approach a wild animal unless you're with a trained biologist. And the first thing we're gonna do <laughs> is shoot a little dart gun and it has a little like, like like bright green dart thing that goes into their arm like a shot and it gives them a sedative they fall right asleep and then once they're asleep we give them a checkup now here's the best part little baby bears that are just born they're so little they can't create their own body heat so during the like five minutes that we're giving them a checkup and listening to their heart and their breathing and all that we have to actually snuggle them in our jackets <laughs> and give them our body heat so they stay warm and it just so happens that's also the perfect time to take photos of the science that you're doing. <laughs> and so again, if you follow me on social or if you like see some of the like YouTube videos and whatnot I've done, you'll see me like cuddling baby bears literally in the name of science. Like it, I'm helping the planet by snuggling these animals. So it's let's let's, let's recap Gandhi. Yes. The mama <laughs> bear is asleep before she snuggles the baby cub and she's doing Ding. it so that she can do like a little physical, you know, uh, to make sure the baby- Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, okay, I got it. You got Ding. it. Ding. Listen, Ding. I am very, very aware that if I ever see a little baby cub, I just need to get the hell out of wherever I am because mom is probably not far behind and it's time to go away, right? I Listen, just... I feel like, I feel like mama bears are just like human moms, right? Like don't touch our kids like right. don't like don't let a stranger come up and start handling our babies like it's not gonna work yeah so <laughs> we're the same i respect them i'm a mom right like they respect me and so i know that like they have to be fully sedated in order to handle their babies but just to get this straight in oh, case yeah, you missed again. no 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 in <laughs> case you missed what she does we are talking to dr ray win grant she is telling us how she goes into a hibernating bear's den 
tranquilizes it, takes the cubs, and then takes care of the cubs and does medical checkups on both the cubs and the mama bears. That's insane to me. Like, that is the coolest absolute best job in the world and I know you haven't just worked with bears you've worked with lions you just said earlier right. that you work with sharks can you name some of the animals that you deal with oh my gosh so I am so fortunate that this career has taken me around the world I've been doing it for like I've started college 20 years ago so it's like I kind of have been doing it for that long I have worked with African lions for years like there was a point I was living in Tanzania studying lions doing the same thing with these lion mamas and cubs I studied grizzly bears and black bears and lemurs in Madagascar ring-tailed lemurs so I've studied cool lowland gorillas wow. in the Congo basin. I mean, I have gone to Asia, to South America. I've done jaguar studies in Panama. I mean, like almost everything, almost everything. I still have like a bucket list of animals yeah. I haven't studied, um, but it's been an incredible career. And, you know, I, I'm happy to say that like a lot of these wildlife populations are doing better, right? I'm not just cuddling bears just like to get the thrill of it, right? Like we're trying to figure out what they need so that we can provide more of what they need so that like humans and wild animals can both like thrive. Is there something and, that you've taken away from this that like surprised you about a certain animal? Like you would it like blew your mind where you're like, I didn't know that about that animal. You know what? Like. I think coyotes are the ones that have blown my mind the most. And I feel like probably a lot of people listening have experiences with coyotes, right? Because more and more we're seeing them like in and around cities. We're hearing people mm -hmm. talk about coyotes. They are extremely tolerant of humans, but humans are intolerant of coyotes. Like that surprises me because a lot of the animals I study are like so sensitive, right? Like if they are like near humans, if they hear human noises, then they like can't sleep and their whole biology is thrown off coyotes can like thrive in some of these cities and it's just people who freak out about them and I thought that's been like such a surprise to me wow I'll tell you what, I lived in Boston for a while and the coyotes are definitely coming into the city a lot more on my first day of work when I was at Boston in Boston I got out of my car and there was a coyote in the parking lot and I just mm -hmm. kind of looked at it kept going it looked at me kept going neither one of us bothered the other but mm -hmm. I was like mm -hmm. was that a coyote just chilling in the parking lot in Boston wow bizarre but you just said you have a bucket list of animals that you have not worked with yet that you want to work with. What are yeah. they? Yeah, yeah. The number one animal that I have never, I've never worked with and I've never seen in the wild, and that's a tiger. Like literally, like once I get tigers, I'll have lions and tigers and bears, and that's just <laughs> cute, right? Like that's just cute. That's like, obviously that's meant for me. But I've never traveled to India or South Asia, and I've never seen a tiger in the wild. I've never gotten to work with tigers, but I know some of the top tiger biologists out there who are doing incredible work. And like literally 10 years ago, we didn't know if we were gonna have tigers today. Wow. And we have more tigers today than we have in decades because so many folks in India and South Asia are doing amazing work doing that conservation. So I'll get there. I know I'll get there. I think I'll get there soon, actually. So. Oh, my gosh. Please take me with you. I will go to school. I'll study whatever I need to. <laughs> I promise. So for you, with all these different animals that you've encountered, and yes, they are endangered species, but they're also kind of terrifying species, the ones that you have listed. Have you ever had any crazy encounters with them, close calls? <laughs> This is the question I get more than anything. The answer is yes. yes. The answer is yes. I have almost died too many times. Really? I feel so bad for my parents. My poor parents have had to just like count their blessings over and over. So I will say I'll plug my little podcast. I have a podcast with PBS Nature. It's called Going Wild with Raywin Grant. And the most popular episode of my podcast is called Near Death Experiences, where I talk about all the times I almost died at the hands of wild animals. And I'll give, there's like, 20 examples, but I will give one here where I was studying bears in the Sierra Nevada mountains, right? This was like summer of one of my PhD years. So I was younger, I was in grad school, I was an idiot, right? <laughs> and I was spending the full summer in like over a hundred degree temperatures, like in the desert of Nevada. And I was setting traps for bears because we have to put a GPS collar on them. But and that collar tells us where they are. But before we get the collar on them, we have to trap them, right? We don't know where they are. So we set traps all over the mountains. And my job as the like intern grad student was to check the traps every day. We don't want to have a bear in a trap for more than like 12 hours or something, right? Especially in that heat. 
And so every day I was checking these traps in the middle of nowhere. I was camping by myself for weeks on end, by myself in the mountains. And there were no bears, just none, not a single bear ever. So I started getting lazy. I stopped carrying my bear spray. I stopped carrying my like whistles. I stopped carrying my water. And one day I checked a trap, no bear. And I start putting the bait back in the trap, some new bait. And as soon as I turn around to go back, there is a huge male black bear, like three feet from me. Like I could smell his breath and he was pawing the ground and he was like, they do this like shaking their head thing. And he started charging me and I did the thing you're not supposed to do. Like after all of my training, (laughs) I knew knew exactly the protocol. I panicked, I totally (laughs) panicked and I ran. Oh. And that is the one thing that you do not do with a bear is you do not run. You're supposed to back away slowly and make yourself look big and kind of yell at the bear. Honey, I dropped everything. I ran. The bear chased me. <gasps> oh I could gosh. feel it like nipping at my butt the whole time. <laughs> oh. Literally, I was crying. I was like running, crying, praying, falling down this oh. mountain, like getting dirt and shit up my head. I'm sorry. I You're fine. Cursed. Getting like dirt and stuff like up my nose. Like it was a disaster. And literally the reason I'm around today is because the bear just decided not to eat me. Like the bear, any bear can outrun a person easily. They run 35 miles an hour. I can run, you know, two miles an hour. Right. <laughs> so like, <laughs> like it just decided like she's weak. Like, let me not even try it. But that was like my life flashed before my eyes. I was just like, oh my God, here I am thinking I'm protecting these bears. I just pissed one off and now it's chasing me away. Oh my God, that is terrifying. Whoa. Nipping was at you? No. Horrible, horrible. So is the is the adage true? Brown lay down, black fight back, and white good night with the bears? Yeah, you know, I feel bad <laughs> about the white good night because like polar bears, like they are the biggest the the world's largest carnivore and they're also like one of like they're just the biggest predator that we have on this planet right they're huge they're over a thousand pounds like they could just like like push you (laughs) and you're dead right so so there's just like a low chance of survival if you're having an actual attack from a polar bear but i think it's important to note that like most people don't get attacked by a polar bear just because you see a polar bear or just because you're surprised by a polar bear or just because you upset a polar bear doesn't mean it's going to attack you no wait if, if we're that... talking about an attack then yeah it's over it's like what's up if that <laughs> black bear had been a polar bear do you think it would have chased you and you would that have been it yeah yep i would not be here <laughs> good yep. r.i.p nice. me oh good night yeah <laughs> good night i'm really I'm so glad serious. you ran it <laughs> oh my gosh yep. i could talk yep. to you forever so without giving us the actual story because we will send people to your podcast which sounds incredible and now i have something to do for the rest of today <laughs> and tomorrow what are some of the other animals that you have encountered in similar scenarios and almost died yeah. yes so, I mean, kind of the top animal. So my bear story, I have another bear story on the podcast. Also a terrifying lion story that <gasps> the story the story includes me peeing all over myself <laughs> in an incredibly <laughs> undignified fashion. Um, there's something in East Africa. There's an animal called a red spitting cobra. Oh, yeah. And red spitting cobras, I mean... They're amazing. So if you're into snakes, they're just like mind-blowingly cool. But they do this thing, you know, cobras have that little like hood on the back of them. They kind of stand up. These shoot venom out of their teeth and the venom targets your eyes and gets into your eyes and then makes you blind. Oh my God, it's like the thing in Jurassic Park. <laughs> it is It is why I'm telling you, like there's some wild stuff out there. It's not always the big things that are going to get you. Like sometimes it's like the teeny tiny little slithery things. So I have a red spitting cobra story that is unmatched, I am sure. <laughs> And then, and then there's several, there's, there's several others. Let me just oh. th- tell you, it's a, it's a lot. It's been a wild, wild life. Can we go back to extinct animals? Like, is there one animal in particular that is, it's like basically almost gone and almost done? Oh my gosh. I mean, this is sad, but yeah. So, so there's a couple species of rhinos in, uh, East Africa and Southern Africa that are almost done. I believe it's like the Northern white rhino. There's a couple of them left, like four left. And that's really hard, right? Because rhinos are like, they're big and they look ferocious, right? But they're like very gentle. They just eat grass all day. You know, Mm. they're these amazing creatures and 
due to a mix of like land transformation and let me just say like the legacy of colonialism in Africa like is what started driven, driving them to extinction and now poaching is a huge threat. There's not very many of them and that makes me really sad. Rhinos, when you see them on the African landscape, it just looks right. It's just like everything looks like how it's supposed to look. You know, and like, yeah. you know, that like the ecosystem is functioning, but we're not going to have them like it's it's pretty much over yeah. for them. And there's a couple of other species like that, too. But it doesn't have to be that way moving forward. We really have power. We're doing great already with conservation. Join me, everyone out there who's considering like a career in science. Trust me, you can have so much fun with it. You can See, be outside Gandhi? with it. There's still See? time for you. <laughs> Change your career. Like, come on out with me. I'll teach you how to hold bears like. There's a lot that can be done. There's a lot of reasons for hope. I love to hear that. So yeah. quickly, before you go, what I, I want to highlight a couple things about you because I think that within your field, you're probably a unicorn yourself or a white rhino yourself. You're a woman. <laughs> are there a lot of women in your field? You know what? There are not a lot of women in the wildlife ecology field. And the women who are in it, myself included, are not necessarily in leadership, right? So that's kind of like what we see in a lot of these fields. It's like, okay, women are getting there. Women are passionate. Like they're opening some doors for us. But in terms of leadership, in terms of like being at the top, you're not seeing very many women. And so I'm a woman. I'm a black woman. I am a black woman from the inner city. Like I grew up in San Francisco back when San Francisco had an inner city. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed, but like that's where I'm from. And so, like, I didn't go outside with my family, right? Like, we didn't go, like, camping and hiking and stuff. So I didn't see my first wild animal until I was in my 20s. I didn't go on my first hike until I was in my 20s. Like, I was, like, well into college when I realized, like, this is what I want to do, but I have zero experience. So that's something that's also really important for people to know is that you don't have to be, like, some person who goes to Yosemite, you know, every weekend to be made for this field. I've made a lot of change. I have gone all over the world. I've had adventures of a lifetime. And I feel like I'm just getting started. Well, I think you're fascinating. And I appreciate you joining us so much. Thank you for that. And Gandhi would like to live in your back pocket. Thank you. I want you to <laughs> Come become on. my best friend, please. <laughs> um, if you could give us some advice for just the everyday person, we're talking about conservation and how we're going to save the planet and save these animals. What advice can you give the everyday person to make that move? Oh, my gosh. It's so easy. Vote. I am so serious. A lot of people think that when we are in election season, we're just electing a person, right? But every single election has environmental issues on the ballot, right? Like show up to the polls and vote for the environment. There are politicians who support the environment and some that don't, but also there is like literal legislation. Like I'm talking about the coyotes. I'm talking about the bears. I'm talking about like the, the eagles flying around. Like that kind of stuff is on the ballots and you don't have to be a scientist to make an impact there. So go to the polls and vote in favor of the environment. I love that. Wow. Thank you. Drop your podcast one more time. It is Going Wild with Dr. Raywin Grant from PBS Nature. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. And on Instagram, where can we find you? You can find me across social, but I like Instagram the most, okay. at Raywin Grant, R-A-E-W-Y-N-N-G-R-A-N-T. Come visit. Thank you so much for joining us. You are wonderful and you're inspirational, and I will stalk you even more than I already <laughs> have. So I appreciate you spending some time with us. Thank you. This has been the best. Have me back. I'll oh, be back. Absolutely. Don't you worry. <laughs> the Mercedes-Benz Interview Lounge.